Chapter 34, Edge of Night. Alrighty. What do you say we get on out of Creepy Town? Darkness. Everything had gone black. Even the junction terminal was completely dead. Well, fuck. Okay, not entirely unexpected. The message left for Shadowhorn by Scootaloo warned that shutting down the Crusader mainframe would shut off all the automated turrets. And since the Crusader mainframe ran virtually everything, that meant all systems were automated. I had stopped Elder Cottage Cheese. I just hoped I hadn't caused the outcasts their base in the process. I turned on the lamp on my pit buck. Its light seemed somehow ghostly in the raining quiet. Checking my Pipbuck's auto map, I was pleased to find that interacting with the junction had revealed the entrance to the Crusader mainframe secure room. I pushed myself up and started towards the entrance. With speed, I could get there and reboot the spell matrix in Strawberry Lemonade's power armor before Steel Hooves could finish cutting his way in. I fought a niggling sense of panic. If I just broke the stable, I was going to be in so much trouble. That quiet didn't last long. Shouts echoed through the halls. As I trotted into the atrium, I passed the two knights I had overheard talking earlier. They were galloping towards the security station, the spotlights on their helmets cutting swaths of illumination, one of them still pulling the trash behind her. Emergency lights came on through the stable, bathing the halls in a pale orange. I exhaled in relief. Thank you, Apple Bloom, for thinking of everything. Hello, residents of Stable 29, a sweet-sounding mayor's voice called out over the stable loudspeakers. My name is Sweetie Belle, and I am, was, one of the founding ponies of Stable Tech. I cast a look at one of the speakers as I passed by. What was this? If you are hearing this, it means that the Crusader mainframe that has been running Stable 29 since it was sealed was shut down moments ago because it posed a threat to the ponies under its care. Sweetbell's voice was calming. I slowed to a walk. Emergency subsystems have been activated to care of life-sustaining and security systems. The voice of Sweetbell informed us. Unfortunately, these subsystems have a limited lifespan and will only function for five years. For ponies trapped in a stable beneath an irradiated hellscape, five years would have been a major problem. For us, it was virtually a gift from heaven. I'm afraid you'll have to figure out what to do from here on your own, but don't panic. You are all good ponies. And you can do more than you think if you just put your minds to it. I know you would do just fine. Good luck, my little ponies. I rounded the corner into the maintenance wing, only to see a machine gun turret lowering out of a sliding ceiling panel, silhouetted hellish by the orange emergency lighting behind it. I slid to a stop, eyeing the turret. Calamity had shut down all the security turrets last time we were here, but the subsystems must have brought them back online. Still, without the Crusader trying to wipe out the stable's population, it shouldn't be hostile, right? The turret clicked, beeping, and spun at me. I dove back around the corner as bullets spattered off the walls. What the fuck? A newly automated voice came over the speakers, this time an anonymous mayor. Crusader mainframe, emergency shutdown successful. Security subsystems attempting to discern the nature of the emergency and provide assistance. I heard more gunfire from deeper in the stable. Analysis. Dead Water Talisman, Celestia Tier Emergency, contacting nearest Stable Tech Supply House for delivery of replacement talisman. Contact failed. Supply House not responding, or no longer exists. Attempted to contact Secondary Supply House. Contact failed. Secondary Supply House unreached. I floated out a little Macintosh, and checked the load. Analysis. Hostile Takeover. Luna Tier Emergency. Anti-intruder measures have been engaged. All residents of the stable should retreat to one of the safe rooms until threat has passed. I slid into sats. As I jumped back into the wall, 
My targeting spell locked onto the turret, and I fired four shots into its hull. The turret exploded like a shower of sparks with the third hit. I broke into a gallop, sure that the Crusader mainframe was in a safe room. I wanted to get there and get strawberry lemonade back on her hooves before the room sealed off. Fortunately, the secret entrance that Cottage had used was on the maintenance level, just around the next... I skidded to a halt as I turned the next corner and found myself facing two more sentry guns. I scrambled back the way I had come as bullets tore through the air behind me. Identifying resident locations via pit buck tags. Number of Stable 29's residents, zero. The voice said dispassionately. Number of Stable Tech or Stable 29 residents outside of the safe rooms, zero. Safe rooms sealing now. Crap. I didn't have time to reload Little Macintosh. Instead, I drew out both the Zebra Rifle and the Sniper Rifle. I hoped my skills in marksmanship had improved enough to target multiple stationary targets on my own. Sats was not designed to aid with multi-weapon telekinesis, especially with such different weapons. I spun around the corner, aiming as swiftly as I could. The hall filled with bullets firing from each direction. I felt the impact that several hit, hit my armor, but did not penetrate. I felt a burning graze in my neck, or my left cheek, and a much more serious pain as a bullet punctured my right hind leg. The sniper rifle fired twice, punching holes through the whole plating of the first turret. The zebra rifle tore at the second one as it set the turret on fire. The turret exploded, taking its wounded twin out with it. I wobbled, pain lancing up my hind leg. I wasn't going to make it now. Not when I couldn't run. Safe rooms sealed, the mayor's voice announced, informing me that it wouldn't have mattered anyway. There had never been enough time. Deploying neurotoxin gas. Wait, what? I remember Night Strawberry Lemonade calling for me to take out Cottage by gassing the room, but I didn't realize that was actually possible. But stables tend to be dangerous. Stern had warned us in Philadelphia. They often have their own security, or their own unique dangers. I turned frantically, looking around. I needed to get out of the hall, but where could I go that would be safe? The safe rooms were already sealed. I suddenly felt very tired. Having no better choice, I started hobbling back down the maintenance wing. I wanted to get to the Pitbuck Technician's stall. There was no logic behind the choice. It just felt like the best place for me to be. I probably wasn't thinking straight. I felt so tired. Tired. And heavy. I wondered what kind of gas was going to be released. Would I hear it? Would I be able to smell it? Would it burn my eyes and lungs? So far, there was nothing. Not even a haziness in the air. A flutter of hope moved in my heart. Maybe, after 200 years, the intruder countermeasures no longer worked. Maybe, there was no gas. The idea made me feel a little better, but also a little dizzy. Dizzy. And tired. And heavy. Oh no. And then, I was falling back into the darkness again. I didn't even feel my body hit the floor. I woke up in the Stable 29 clinic. Not my favorite room in any stable. And particularly, not in this one. Welcome back, little pip. Sheila's deep voice rumbled. We're situated to leave for Bucking Cross. When are you ready? My mouth felt dry and cottony. My voice rasped as I asked. Why am I not dead? I could feel a throbbing pain in my right hind leg. Beneath the compressive wrapping of the healing bandages. The toxin was designed to incapacitate. Not kill. The voice was level remedies, but I barely recognized it. She sounded as bad as I did. Either Stable Tech didn't want to trust the threat analysis of their own subsystems with something that could wipe out the stable, or they expected the inhabitants to want prisoners. She sounded like she was quickly reaching the same level of dislike for stables that I had. I can't believe they gassed the clinic. Well, I grunted. Unsurprised that Velvet Remedy's response to the power shutdown had been to push her way to the clinic. The place ponies would come for help. 
Maybe they just gassed the atrium. After all, there's a big hole in the window where it used to be. I pushed myself upright. A nauseating wave of dizziness nearly knocked me off the gurney I had been laying on. Ugh. I looked to Velvet Remedy. Are you okay? I won't be singing again for a few days, she said dourly. She looked a little haggard, but thankfully uninjured. But otherwise, everyone's fine. She added, and Zebra. And the Rangers? Environmentally sealed armor with rebreathers, Silu said, sounding just a touch proud of Applejack's technology. Gas never got to us. Well, those of us in our suits, that is. Cross? I asked, my, ho my throat hurting. Strawberry? Both fine. They were in the stable safe rooms. I rebooted sta uh, nice strawberry lemonade's armor myself. I nodded. Made sense security would qualify. Or, at least the armory. And Star Paladin Crossroads would have had plenty of time to step into that before it sealed. From the tone of steel of his voice, I had guessed that Strawberry Lemonade had shown more thanks than he was comfortable with. I wish I could have seen it. Was any pony... shot? Well, you were. Velvet Remedy rasped sharply. Then, with a more somber tone, Yes, a few others. Mercifully, no fatalities. But there are some ponies here who won't be walking around again for a few weeks. In one case, I'm afraid, the damage was permanent. The weight of the damage I had caused pushed me back down onto a gurney. I stared at the ceiling, wondering how many ponies had been hurt and how long they would be in pain. Good work with Cottage, Steelhoofs told me, although I certainly didn't feel like I deserved any congratulations. The Elder is still alive, but comatose. His fault, not yours. We have him in his life support pod, ready for delivery. Comatose, I whispered, as a dull pain settled over me that had nothing to do with my injuries. Will he ever? Probably not, Steelers replied bluntly. He made it sound like a good thing. I... I'm sorry. A lump caught in my throat as I stared to a knight, stallion, laying on a gurney. He'd been shot up pretty bad by one of the suddenly active turrets in the men's dormitory. He hadn't been in his armor. He'd been off shift and curled up to sleep only to wake up his bullets tore into his back, screaming in pain as two shot his fellow rangers. Two of the fellow rangers left to destroy the turret. I imagined myself in his place. Then I wondered if he'd ever be able to sleep easily again. For what? The stallion asked bitterly. Hey, ain't your fault. I blame Cottage, if any pony. I didn't. Blinking back a tear, I put a hoof on his shoulder. Is there anything I can do? I think you've done enough, he retorted, then looked apologetic as I winced. I nodded and turned to go. Calamity and Zenith were trotting down the hallway toward me. I stopped in shock when I saw Zenith's horn. For a moment, I thought the zebra had been transformed into a unicorn. Badly. But then I quickly saw the straps holding the metal plate to her forehead, the curving, wicked horn jutting out of it. I chuckled, despite my melancholy. So, you finally got the chance to build one of the Hellhound helmets, I see, I said to Calamity as the rust-coated Pegasus paused to open a trash bin with a wing. I recognized now the product of the schematics we had discovered at Hippocampus Energy Plant number 12. Several Hellhound claws were wonder-glued together to form an exceptionally lethal horn. Yup, Clemmy said proudly as he fished his old pack of cigarettes out of the trash. Zenith looked mildly less thrilled. Using such a weapon is not proper Fallen Caesar style, she commented, her exotic voice taking a dour tone. But the Pegasus has argued well that hooves alone are no match for an alicorn shield. 
I blinked. Are we expecting more trouble with the alicorns? I asked hesitantly. I seem to remember a warning about alicorns in the Canterlot ruins. I thought we were on a mission from the goddess. Surely they let us pass. Sloping the cigarette pack into his saddlebags, Comedy frowned with a look of grim discomfort. Well, let's just say we ain't taking any chances. The storm from the night before had given way to a light drizzle as Calamity wore the Sky Bandit between the dark and skeletal husks that had once been Manhattan's skyscrapers. We were headed to Bucking, or Buckland Cross and a part of the city that I had not yet seen. Velvet Remedy stirred, coming out of the Flourish Orb for what seemed the second time since we left Stable 29 this morning. I looked away, not meeting the gaze coming from Steelhoof's helmet. Every pony deserved their little retreats. There's something I don't understand, Velvet Remedy admitted, looking to me as she put the memory orb away. Her voice was still a little raspy, but not as bad as it was a few hours ago. I wasn't in the mood for conversation, and my insistence I had been led around to all the outcasts who had been hurt, and the security system activated. I apologized to each one. Most were polite, and some even thanked me for dealing with Cottage, and possibly relieving or revealing two locations for backup water talismans to boot. But one of them snapped at me over it. More should have. Little Pip, you said that Red Eye talked about controlling the sun, the moon, and the weather. Not even the goddess Celestia will be able to control the weather all across Equestria. Does he really expect that mimicking what Trixie has been able to do will make him more powerful than Celestia? I shrugged, not knowing and not feeling like speaking. Honestly, I had no idea. Velvet Remedy shook her head. For that matter, why focus on the sun and the moon? Either Celestia and Luna are up there somewhere guiding them, like they always have. Velvet glanced towards Calamity, her eyes meeting with his as he looked back over his shoulder at the conversation. Or, Calamity is right. The goddesses are simply dead. The sun and the moon are doing just fine on their own. Which means that the goddesses were never really intended or really needed in the first place. Sure, being their guide would be a status symbol, Velvet said, but Red Eye seems practical. Why turn himself into something like her to do something that doesn't need to be done? Clementy veered away from the blackened husks of a building as a dozen of pigeons burst out. I slipped off my bench as the passenger wagon tilted, thumping my right hind leg hard enough to bring tears to my eyes. Pyrelight left from Velvet Remedy's side, soaring out one of the windows into the open air, giving chase. Blinking, I considered crawling back onto the bench. The bench was more comfortable than the but lying on it risking another spill. I decided to just stay on the floor. Is it not obvious? Zena said. He wishes to be worshipped like a god. How better to become one than to take your role of the goddesses? I shook my head. I don't think that's it. Red Eye had talked as if he was removing himself from the equation. Like doing so was akin to dying. He was many things, but not a megalomaniac. Y'all are making assumptions. That's just so. And that just ain't so, Clementy called back. We all turned towards him. And what would that assumption be? Velvet asked in a voice that would have been a purr if not for the after effects of the gas. Y'all talk like the sun and moon are doing what they're supposed to do. Clamity replied, swooping beneath a crumbling and dangerously canted walkway that stretched between two tilting towers. Several blood wings were resting underneath. Why well, I heard it, Celestia would raise the sun at the beginning of the day, then lower it at night. Loon would bring out the moon, then put it away at dawn. That was supposed to be the order of things, right? Well, yes. Velvet Remedy replied. Of course, but clearly that's still been happening. It was night before, and now it's day. And it will be night again, just like clockwork. Oh, it's happening, 
but it ain't nothing like clockwork. I can't tell you how many times when I was growing up that I saw the sun and the moon in the sky at the same time. Velvet and Zenith gasped. I reeled. The very notion was something out of a doomsday prophecy. The sun and the moon never shared the sky. It was unnatural, blasphemous. Usually, it was in the early morning, like they couldn't decide which was supposed to be out. They've gone wild, I reckon. Like the weather. Clement began to gaze, I gracefully turned towards the sky bandit, giving all of us a view of the slate blue expanse of the ocean beyond Manhattan's harbor. I could see a few lights shining from the Pony of Friendship on her island out in the bay. The storm clouds darkened as they stretched out across the sea, and the horizon was obscured by the heavy gray of the rain. Don't happen that often, but it happens enough that no Pegasus ever forgets that there ain't no pony guiding them anymore. Clamity snorted. And it ain't always in the morning. Once, middle of the day, about a generation after the war, the sun and the moon weren't only both in the sky at the same time, they were in the same spot. It was like they collided or something. I was in shock, horrified, by what Calamity was describing. The pony in my head tried to come up with an epitaph, but no lewd reference to the goddesses could match the profanity in that event. I wasn't there, of course, Calamity told us, but I've seen pictures. Sun turned into a big black disc, pouring out reddish light like it was the end of the world. Plenty of Pegasus folk thought it was. There was rioting. Ponies got killed. Enclave stepped in, restored peace. I think that was when they really took control. It was late evening when we first laid eyes on the buckling bridge. Cross. The skyscrapers had fallen behind us, and the Manhattan ruins had become a gray maze of crumbling structures and flattened buildings radiating out from the Manhattan blast zone. We could clearly see where the Balefire bomb had gone off. What had once been Manhattan's city center had been scoured to the foundations in a huge radius. The blast zone was almost uniformly smooth, save for odd lines where underground tunnels and channels had channels of blast. It glistened like glass. Beyond the Manhattan blast zone, beyond miles of shattered city, a murky river cut through the land. Its shores marked the boundary between Manhattan and Buckland, one of Manhattan's largest suburbs. The Buckland Bridge had once spanned the river. It had once been Manhattan's crowning landmark. A massive, multi-tiered suspension bridge with huge brickwork piers that included rentable living spaces. The Buckland Bridge had collapsed from both ends, leaving only a single freestanding pier in the middle of the river, a stretch of roadway, ha roadway hanging out over the water in each direction. When viewed from the right angle, it did look like a giant cross. Little rivulets of rainwater were pouring off each of the end, and the wind caught the water in misty sprays. The meeting point for our exchange with the Steel Rangers was on this side of the river, so I was alarmed when Calamity flew past it, swooping over the water. Hang on! What? I asked, crawling up onto the bench and floating out binoculars. I looked first downwards, towards the cracked remains of a wagon hitching lot, I believe it was our destination, and indeed, there were several paladins looking up through the rain at me with upturned visors and more waiting in the ruins beyond. I spotted at least a dozen. Were they planning to ambush us? Or were they protecting themselves should we try to double cross them? I pointed out what I had spotted to steel hooves. Make sure your guns are loaded, he replied, then turned to Calamity. Where are you going? I turned my gaze to Buckland Cross, noting more steel rangers moving between the wreckage of wagons and defensive barricades. There were multiple turrets, including several mounted at the bottom of the bridge, which clearly kept it free of blood wings. And I noted a few tank-like sentinel bots rolling about on patrol. Structures had been built between the tiers and between the columns of the pier, supplementing the living spaces already inside the pillar. 
A line of cranes held several small boats over the edge of the bridge railing. All in all, the Steel Rangers Manhattan Citadel looked cramped, but ridiculously secure. It would take them considerable time to send reinforcements, and they would have to do so by boat. I noticed other boats in the river. Small, light craft, pushed over by water. Uh, pushed in the water by huge fans. A hoof full of them skimmed down or skimmed around like insects near a small settlement along the shore of the dim shadow of Buckland Cross. Once, in the old Equestria, the buildings had been a small strip mall, apparently dominated by two competing coffee shops. The two shops had fought to out-advertise each other, culminating in each building a giant billboard over their respective corners of the mall. The billboards were for Java's Cup, and had collapsed, crushing through the roof of the adjacent Sunny Suds laundromat. The opposite billboard had suffered severe damage from smoke and age, leaving only four letters on the sign, clearly legible. A-R-B-U. The residents of Arbu had ringed the asphalt field that had once been the mall's complimentary parking with passenger and delivery wagons, using scavenged plates of scrap metal to fortify the barricade. It was a passable defense, but in comparison to the fortifications of Buckland Cross, the little village looked like a target. Several of the signboards from above the strip mall, <clears throat> including the sign for Java's Cup, the size of a schoolroom chalkboard, had been cobbled together to create a gate which could be opened and closed through a system of chains and pulleys. Above, the ponies had fashioned a sign, Arbu, friendliest town in the wasteland. The gate was being slowly drawn upward to allow a merchant caravan to exit the town. Anyone had drawn Calamity's attention before I even saw them. The rain-soaked ponies I saw moving beyond the rubble, setting an ambush for the caravan, didn't look like raider ponies. They looked, or they lacked the fuck up, scourge of pony kind motif. No necklaces of pony bones or cutie marks or bloodied weapons. They just looked like bandits. Uh, Calamity? Maybe we should just scare them off. So they can just attack the next caravan instead? Calamity asked gruffly, kicking the reload bar of his battle saddle. Plan to go around apologizing to every pony they kill after we let them go? That stung. I shut up. There were nine of them. I watched several taking aim down rifles pointed towards Arbu. One, a slave of unicorn mare, floated a heavy assault rifle in position. If we didn't interfere, this would be a slaughter. Clamity lined up the first of the bandits and opened fire. A double shot from his battle saddle and the pony fell, missing part of his head. The bandits all turned and looked to where the shot had come from, only one of them to look at the sky. Clamity fired again, just as the pony pointed upwards and cried out a warning to her companions. One of Clamity's bullets tore into the bottom of her pointing, pointing hoof, wrecking her foreleg. The other had her thick leather armor. She fell back, badly wounded. Pyrolite swooped in front of us, diving down towards the bandit. The magnificent Huntress let out a blast of green flame, setting the wounded bandit ablaze. I could hear her screams as she burned to death. The remaining bandits, seven of them, dove for cover, taking their weapons skyward. One black coated earth pony, with a sawn off shotgun, swung his weapon towards Pyrolite. Blam! The beautiful Bayflyer Phoenix let out a squawk of pain and fell from the sky, bouncing off a freestanding wall and landing in a trash bin. Velvet Remedy cried out in dismay. Calamity! Get us down there now! She screamed. Dozens of bullets sparked off the Sky Bandit, echoing metallically. I floated up the zebra rifle and peered down the scope. The other ponies were shooting back at us, but the Black Stallion shotgun didn't have the range. Instead, he was crouching behind a mailbox, looking for better cover. I brought up my targeting spell and took aim. His cover was good. It would be tricky to get shot on him. I paused, and slipped away the zebra rifle, bringing out the sniper rifle instead. I reasoned that an armor-piercing shot would go right through the mailbox, but the real reason is that I didn't want to set these ponies on fire. It felt so wrong to kill them like that. But I was still going to kill them. Did that make me 
corrupted kindness, after all. Calamity banked, firing again. One of the bandit ponies learned the hard way that her cover was just not quite good enough. She screamed as one of the bullets clipped her in her flank, the other pinging off the concrete she was hiding behind with a shower of white dust. Damn it! Move to where I can see you! Steelhoof's deep voice wearily commented. I don't think she's much obliged to do so. He moved up to one of the passenger wagon's broken windows, warning us to get back. The missile launcher built into his battle saddle opened up. Two rockets whooshed out. The backlash of the launcher filling the wagon with choking smoke. I threw myself to a window, more to breathe than to see, and watched as the missile struck home on the bandit mare's concrete shield, blasting it apart. The mare's body was bloodily torn apart by chunks of blast-propelled concrete. More shots. This time, neither from the bandits nor from us. Several armed ponies charging out of Arbu, firing pistols and rifles at the bandits. Others were moving to protect the merchant. The remaining bandits were forced to split their attention. The slate blue unicorn bandit turned her assault rifle towards the incoming ponies of Arbu and opened fire, spraying wildly. The town ponies dived for cover amongst the lurks of old chariots and crumbling walls that had once been a dentistry's office. At the gate, one of the ponies knocked the merchant out of the line of fire, taking several bullets in the side. More hit the merchant's heavily laden, two-headed cattle, who mooed in fright and pain. That broke my battle stupor. I floated the sniper rifle in front of me, peered down the scope, and sent three armor-piercing bullets through the mailbox. The black stallion toppled, lying on his side. His sides heaving with each breath he slowly he took as he slowly let out. Clamity had maneuvered close enough in his efforts to land for Velvet that I could hear the cries of the colt who suddenly galloped out from under a pile of metal boxes. Daddy! No. No. Celestia raped me with a slower flare, no. The colt ran right up to the fallen stallion, throwing himself on his dying father, and right into the line of fire. What have I done? Velvet Remedy's shield spell flashed over the colt and his fallen father. I slid my weapon away, feeling an icy numbness pass through me. They are bandits, I tried to tell myself, but I was not ready for bandits with family. Please, I prayed to Celestia, don't let the father die. The father I put three bullets through. Below, a rifle shot from one of the bandits caught an Arbu mare square in the chest. She fell, coughing up blood once, twice, then never coughed again. Steelhoof's grenade minigun tore at my eardrums as a switch of explosives ripped through the bandit's defenses, killing two of them and sending the others scattering. Another twin shot from Calamity felled one of the bandits as he ran, blood painting the broken wall beside him. Another took several shots from the Arbu town ponies. Most of the bullets impacted the bandit's armor, with little effect, but a lucky shot pierced her eye. The shot knocked her head back, and the black socket of her eye, ringed with blood, stared vacantly upwards towards us. Unbidden, the nightmarish vision of the sun and the moon shared the sky, becoming a dark disc ringed with fire, blossoming in my mind. I shuddered uncontrollably. As the mare fell, the last bandit turned and fled into the ruins. Two of the Arbu ponies gave chase. I could tell Calamity wanted wanted to as well, but Velvet was desperate to get to Pyrelite. The passenger wagon wobbled in the air as Calamity made its decision. Then we turned, dropping down to the nearest stretch of road. Velvet Remedy leaped out through one of the windows before we had touched down. She too had a decision to make. Both the father and Pyrelite might already be dead, but if either lived, it was unlikely that they would live long enough for her to care for the other one first. She paused looking in the direction of one, then another. I could see the trembling pass through her legs, and with a tormented cry, she made her decision, and galloped towards Pyrelite as fast as she could. As she ran, her horn glowed, opening one of her medical boxes, healing bandages and potions and drugs spilled out. Zenith! Little Pip! Help him, please! 
she begged us at the top of her voice as she left us behind. Telekinetically, swooping up the dropped medical supplies, I ran towards the father and his colt. Zenith galloped at my side. You can't have my son. The black stallion rasped weakly as two of the Arbu ponies pulled the colt off of him. The boy's wet mane hung in front of his eyes, the water dripping from it mixed with his tears as he struggled to be reunited with the stallion. We'll take good care of him, one of the Arbu mares promised kindly. Treat him as one of our own. Zenith and I were doing what we could, but the two of us did not equal one velvet remedy. And seeing the extent of the damage made me think that not even she could save him without the aid of a full clinic. Instead, the painkiller was the uh, least was at least dull as pain. God. His breaths were shallow, his eyes glazed and not truly seeing. I could barely see him through the tears in my eyes. I won't let. The rest of his sentence was lost in a final exhalation. The stallion was dead. I stumbled away, breathing heavily, tears falling from my eyes. I'd kill him. I'd killed the colt's father. I was having a hard time breathing. I tried to think of anything I could to make this right. But you couldn't fix dead. There was no way I could make up for this to either the father or his colt. I knew it, and it felt like it was going to kill me. I deserved it. Majors caught the sound of creaking wheels and hooves clopping through puddles. I turned as a pony approached from Arbu, hitched to a wagon. She was a stout apricot unicorn, with a wagon for a cutie mark, and a scar just underneath it. Her coat showed signs of radiation poisoning, and she waved a friendly hello that I half returned. Her horn glowed with a soft brown light that enveloped the father and floated his body upwards and into the cart, placing the black-coated corpse on, on top of several other pony bodies. Arbu was collecting the dead, their own, and the bandits alike. What? I asked weakly. Well, some ponies gotta bury them, replied a green-coated Arbu mare with shockingly orange hair. I felt another shot of pain as I realized the good ponies of Arbu treated the dead of their enemies better than I intended to treat the bodies of ponies I had grown to care about. The images of Pinkie Pie's skeleton and Apple Blooms both floated in front of my mind's eye. I realized how utterly unworthy I was of Homage's affections. I didn't deserve the friends I had found. And I couldn't keep going like this. I couldn't keep doing this. I needed to do better. I needed to be better. Velvet Remedy appeared. Tears in her eyes. Oh, goddesses, no. Not Pyrelite, too. But this time, my worries were in vain. She'll live, Velvet announced. If the shotgun was in better repair, it would have been another story. But she's in bad shape. We should get her to someplace radioactive in the next few hours, so she can be skin healing properly. If you're looking for radiation, one of the Arbu ponies, a milk-colored mare with a stringy tan mane, and a birth defect that left her with only one eye, said as she trotted up, shaking Velvet's hoof in a friendly greeting. You can look to the grass breeding facility just up the river. Mind the rad gators, and don't go killing any of them. Grass? I wondered, quizzically, only to be answered with a sharp nod. My eyes strayed to her flank. Her cutie mark looked like several sharp teeth. Radgator teeth, perhaps. She, too, had a scar beneath her cutie mark. A small brand, it looked like. It reminded me of the brand that had obliterated Calamity's cutie mark. Breeding facility? Velvet Remedy asked. Breeding what? Why, Radgators, of course. Weren't you listening? The mayor replied. Oh replied Velvet politely. Little Pip, we should go. I nodded numbly, ambling towards the Sky Bandit. Stu was still there, keeping an eye on the life support cocoon strapped to the roof. 
The status of Elder Kaida's cheese had not changed. Clemity was pulling an old suitcase out of the rusty, rusty hulk of the chariot. My little scavenger. Come back now, you hear? The green mare with the orange mane called out. We'll have dinner. The third time this month, I had to break up a yelling match between Mr. Beans and Jemocha Joe. Ever since Joe opened that new Starbucks across Mr. Bean's Java Cup. First, it was just the two of them trying to undercut the other pony's prices. Then, that turned shipment of coffee beans went missing, and Jomacha Joe started throwing some nasty accusations. Totally groundless, as it turned out. Shipments got rerouted to Philadelphia because of some glitch in the Starbucks terminal system. I can't stand those things. They seem downright unpony. Yesterday, though, Jamocha Joe unveiled a new ad for Starbucks steamy coffee. And woo-wee. Never felt more like buying a cup of coffee in my life. Just to show my appreciation. Now, I don't know what makes steamed coffee so different from any other type. But Mr. Bean was sure steamed about all the ads. Call it blatant use of sex to sell coffee, and I reckon he was pretty on the nose about that. Mr. Beans rallied together a flock of local ponies to stand in front of Joe's place, decrying the poor guy as an immoral and degenerate. The whole think of the children routine and harassing customers. When I arrived to break it up, one of the old mares hit me with her protest sign. Jomacha Joe came out to help, and before I knew it, Mr. Beans and Jomacha Joe were in each other's muzzles, and it looked like it was going to become Bucks. It didn't help that Miss Weathers' stupid yappy poodle got loose, and was adding its own head-splitting noise to the ruckus. Got them settled, and went right to quick cure for some stitches. I can't believe I quit my job in Manhattan for this crap. Calamity's suitcase had been locked. S opening it, I found an old security guard uniform, a cattle prod, a four stars month pass on the Luna line, and a comic book. Sword Mares, the cover featuring a mare who was rendered to be ridiculously hot to the point of deformed, wearing equally ridiculous flank bearing armor and holding a sword in her muzzle as she faced down a monster that looked like a cross between a giant. Yao Guai, and that Moon, a wide-eyed buck cowering behind her. In addition, there was a whole mess of audio logs. Most of the logs had deteriorated beyond salvation, but I was able to download eight of them into my pit buck. My pit buck was clicking at me with a chiding voice. Clemity circled the Sky Bandit around the ruins of the Garsh pink and green hatchery building with a cartoonish, smiling alligator statue in front of it. The hatchery sat between the Manhattan edge and the gloomy river, and a set of train tracks which crossed the street leading up to it. All about were strewn tra uh, tank cars, most of which were leaking a glowing toxic sludge. When the balefire bomb had detonated, the train had derailed, spilling its shipment of radioactive waste across several blocks. The hatchery had gotten the worst of it. Several train cars had been flung into the building, and its water pens smashing them apart. Gummy's Retirement Hotel and Alligator Sanctuary. I spotted at least a dozen giant radgators mulling about in the water, pens, and along the shore. Although, through a shattered wall, of the hatchery building, I saw the shadowy movement of a legendary alligator, easily the size of one of the train cars. We're not going inside, I announced. The mayor from Arbu had asked us not to harm the local wildlife. I wasn't sure why, as the radgators posed a clear threat to the town just downstream. I suspected the bridge under turrets along Buckland Cross regularly had more to shoot at than just blood wings. There's a big one in there. It looks like he could swallow me whole. Love Remedy nickered. We shouldn't need to. 
but you'll set us down on the roof, Calamity. I'll put Pyrolite someplace cozy to rest. She looked down sorrowfully at the wounded bird, wrapped in blankets. The phoenix coughed and stuttered, sending a twinge of worry through my head. Gotcha, Calamity called back, but be quick. I don't think that roof is held up much more than wishful thinking. Why do you believe the ponies wish us to keep these beasts alive? Zenith pondered. I'll tell you why, Calamity laughed. Because Radgator is good eating. Velvet Remedy made a face, and Zenith looked vaguely ill. I, on the other hoof, felt like I had missed an opportunity back on my first day outside. I hadn't even thought of killing and cooking one of the Radgators near the big Macintosh memorial. Clemity flew us in for a landing on the rooftop. He touched down with a clop of his hooves. There was a warning groan, and the roof sagged precariously. I suspected Clamity might be right. But Remedy got out, floating Pyrolite's wrapped body next to her, and began to cross towards a set of crates in one corner of the building, moving cautiously on an unstable surface. I'm going to leave you right over here for a while, Velvet cooed softly. There's lots of nice, warm radiation here. You'll be feeling your old self in no time. The click clicking of my pit buck insisted that she was correct, and that we all should drink some right away as soon as we got away from here. Velvet didn't see the pressure plate, and to be fair, neither did I. The damn thing was so well camouflaged. She was nearly to the crates when she stepped a hoof on it. One of the crates burst open with an explosion of colorful streamers, confetti, and party glitter. The sounds of trumpets blasted through the air, and several 200-year-old balloons did nothing but lie there at the bottom of the crate, deflated and greasy with rot. Velvet Remedy jumped back several feet in panic, surprise. She landed on all four hooves with a sharp thump. The roof collapsed out from underneath us. I felt an awful, lurching weightlessness as the sky bandit tilted and began to fall into the empty space where half the roof used to be. Calamity flapped his wings quickly, lifting us into the air again, as I lashed out with my magic to wrap Velvet Remedy and Pyrolite in bubbles of levitation. Several chunks of ceilings splashed into pools below or clanged off metal walkways as they fell. A crumbling rumble belched up from the building below us. Velvet and Pyrolite slowly floated back towards the waiting Sky Bandit. Obviously, we would have to choose someplace else to cradle Pyrolite while she recuperated. The hulking head of the legendary Radgator snapped up through the opening. I barely pulled Velvet and Pyrolite out of the way. The creature's scales brushed against Velvet Remedy and knocked her out of the levitation bubble. Velvet fell. The charcoal unicorn hit the side of the creature, sliding down its scales and splashing into a pool of much smaller Radgators below. The mammoth Radgator twisted around and opened its maw, snapping at the Sky Bandit. With a mixture of comedy and horror, I realized the monster had no teeth. The huge jaws cl closed onto our ride, threatening to drag us down as the monster gummed at the Sky Bandit. Calamity yelped, his body slammed into a bent girder as he was swung around helplessly in the air, barely sparing his wing. Velvet Remedy splashed, struggling to keep her head above the water as the smaller rat gators closed in. Swimming was not a skill normally developed in stable life. The closest rat gator opened his maw, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. Frantically, she threw her anesthetic spell at it, then flung her forelegs over the paralyzed creature like it was a life preserver. The behemoth rat gator was pulling us into the hatchery. Still not wanting to kill this thing, I drew out the poison dart gun for the first time in ages, firing shot for shot into the soft tissue of its gullet. The radigator released us, toitering and collapsing back into the pool below. The splash hurled Velvet Remedy over the side of the pen, along with several extremely not toothless radigators. Calamity grunted, flapping his wings as he regained control of the passenger wagon. I threw another telekinetic field around Velvet Remedy, pulling her up from the floor as several radigator jaws chomped at the place she had just vacated. Plan B? Zenith asked, not missing a beat. I was just starting to soak in a luxurious bath when I got an emergency call from the mall. Miss Weather was reporting a robbery. I got there, soaking wet, 
my uniform clinging to my coat, only to hear that the thief was Sunny Sud's new Sparkle Cola machine, and that thief was a single bet bit. Apparently, she hit the button for one of those new Sparkle Cola rads, and the machine dispensed a normal Sparkle Cola. Oh, the horror. The operator Sunny Suds naturally had no way of getting into the machine, and I could probably do it with a crowbar, but then I'd probably be fine for the damages. I instead just gave her one of my bits, which she promptly put into the machine, hitting the same button and getting the same damn result. I felt I should receive an award for refraining from using the cattle prod on the old hag. An hour, and a couple packets of right away later, the sky man had flew over the designated meeting spot. The steel rangers had changed their configuration. Many of the backup rangers were now hiding in places that couldn't be targeted from the air. Either that, or they had left. But I didn't really believe the latter was all that likely. <coughs> I licked the inside of my muzzle. Right away tasted like rancid orange juice, and left an aftertaste that was, somehow, even less pleasant. I suspected that Sun Pony had decided to make Rataway fruit flavored as a marketing technique. I wish I could meet that pony and shoot her with a poison dart. The pilot was resting on one of the broken tank cars, bathing in radiation. The giant radiator shouldn't be able to reach her so long as she doesn't roll off the tanker. But Remedy had planted herself a safe distance away, just out of the radiation zone, keeping watch through my binoculars. She had an anesthetic spell in case Pyrolite should fall, or one of the radiators should figure out how to get up to her hiding spot. The combat shotgun had plenty of ammo, in case the spell wasn't enough. As Calamity circled a lot, the rain finally let up. We landed, minus our medical pony, on the edge of the parking lot, facing eight steel rangers whom we could see, and several whom we could not. According to my EFS, one of them was outright hostile. <clears throat> a spot of red in the sea of lights on my compass. Even though she stood her ground patiently, like all the others. We waited as Calamity released himself from the Sky Bandit's harness and shook the rain out of his coat. Then he flew up and released the chains binding Elder Cottage Cheese, this is life support plot, pod, from the roof mounting. As I floated the pod down to hover behind us, Calamity grabbed Spitfire's thunder and took it off the air. <clears throat> She was grunted and took the lead. I followed, floating the pod, Zenith behind me. The atmosphere was like a rubber band, stretched to the point of fraying, about to snap. Goddesses, I don't like this, I muttered under my breath. I had telekinetic sheaths around all my weapons, even though they were still in their holsters. Armor piercing or magical rounds were loaded into each. My ears swiveled, trying to pick up the sounds of steel rangers we couldn't see as they moved into better positions, their little lights sliding back and forth on my EFS compass. Two of the steel rangers approached. One of them was a unicorn scribe wearing robes of pre-war armored mesh. The other was the red light on my compass, a paladin whose battle saddle held what looked like two anti-tank guns. The others stood at the ready, weapon ports open on their battle saddles. We were expecting Steel Ranger traitors. Not one traitor, and a bunch of tribals. Miss Hostility growled. Then, her head bobbed as she took in Steel Hooves. But, it seems they did grace us with Steel Hooves himself. So tell me, Hoovy, are they actually calling you Elder now? Hoovy? I have accepted the position, Steel Hooves said shortly. I believe you have some pony who wished to join us in exchange. Send her out now, and take your elder, and go in peace. Oh, Knight Antmeat, the unicorn said with a note of regret that touched her eyes. I'm afraid she won't be joining us after all. Took a gallop off the short end of the bridge while trying to evade incarceration. I felt my skin tighten around the hairs of my mane. Steelhoof's stance didn't change. His voice seemed unmoved by the news, although I suspected he had to be enraged inside. Were they trying to provoke something? 
More is the pity, Steelhoofs replied evenly, standing very still. The elder had a bit of an accident of his own before we could depart. He's unconscious, but alive. <clears throat> a few of the steel rangers bristled and stomped. But no pony made a foolish move. And the two addressing us seemed to shrug off the news as inconsequential. Paladin Amarantha, the unicorn scribe said, in a tone that only pretended to ask. Would you please check Elder Cottage's pod and make sure all is in order? The armored paladin with the anti-tank weapons trotted a step forward, stopped, then took several steps back. Paladin Amaranth? The unicorn questioned. This is a problem. Amaranth intoned. These aren't just a group of tribals. These are the stable two tribals. That's the stable dweller. She nodded towards me. Yes. I realize that. The unicorn said impatiently. But I don't see how that matters. It matters. Amarantha growled. Because DJ Poem 3 has a boner for her. I cringed at that. The mental image being all manner of wrong. And he's got the whole wasteland believing whatever she says. It was just... If it was just the outcasts, anything that went down here would be our word against theirs. But with her... The unicorn scowled. And what, pray tell, do you think is going to happen here where the truth wouldn't favor us? Paladin Amarantha took two more steps back. This is blown. Kill them all! The moment she spoke, every light on my EFS compass changed to red, except for the unicorn. What? The unicorn shouted, spinning around to face the others. Belay that order! It was too late. Steelhoofs had been standing still, targeting Steel Rangers with his armored targeting spell, even as he talked. Before any of the Steel Rangers could react to the words of either Paladin, Amaratha, or the Unicorn, our Applejack's Ranger was firing loads of high explosive grenades at them. Three of the Steel Rangers were blown into armored giblets before the Unicorn had finished saying, Order. The word drowned out from the rest of the destinations. Paladin, Amaranth, fired at Steel Hooves, almost point blank. The round from her anti tank guns, punching through his armor and flesh, exiting the other side in perfect holes. Steelus fell to the ground with a metallic thump. His light on my compass winked out. Amaranth turned back towards me, with a swift canter, only to find herself looking down the barrel of my sniper rifle, a zebra rifle, and a little Macintosh. I pulled every trigger. From the way blue sparks erupted from the holes I blew in her armor, the magically enhanced bullets in Little Macintosh were probably the ones which killed her. The world around me erupted as the three remaining Steel Rangers launched grenades and missiles at us, neglecting the safety of the Elder and the Unicorn alike. Mercifully, most of the volley missed. They had been targeting Steel Hooves, and the moment he went down, their targeting spells lost their lock. I felt shrapnel and fire slash at me as I was knocked from the ground. My ears ringing, the magical grip I had on my weapons evaporated. Even though the near deafness caused by the explosions, I could still hear Spitfire's thunder echo through the Manhattan shoreline. Two of the Steel Rangers dropped dead before they hit the ground. The third fired two rockets. I watched as Zenith gallop past me, dodging between them and planting herself on her forehooves, swinging about to buck the knight's helmet with such force that it broke his neck. As she looked at me, I saw she had a vital a vial clenched between her teeth. She dropped it. The vial shattered against the ground, and the lot began to fill with fireless smoke. I pushed myself to my hooves, pain lancing through multiple parts of my body. My pit book was sending me medical warnings. Some of my cuts were pretty deep, and I was bleeding badly. My inventory sort of immediately placed within reach the remaining medical supplies I had taken from Velvet Remedy earlier. I administered the last of the painkiller, and down to healing potion. More explosions tore through the ground near me, throwing me back. My head hit the concrete hard enough to daze me. The Steel Rangers, 
who had remained hidden before now, moved in positions and gave them clear lines of fire. My ears were ringing, and my vision blurred, but I could still tell the sound of machine gun fire. The smoke and dust were obscuring my vision, as much with anything else. But my EFS was still picking out targets. I had no idea what happened to Zenith. I looked around, blinking concrete dust out of my eyes, but I couldn't see her. Not even the friendly light that should be on her was on my compass. Another light flared up, a friendly one, as a terrible sound warped in the air. Steelhooves got back to his hooves, in a vortex of unseen necromantic energy. Candlelock ghouls don't stay dead. You have to turn them to ash, or dismember them, to keep them down. I was at once thankful and horrified, fearing even more for our trip into the Cantalot ruins. Somebody was crawling towards me, a friendly light on my compass. I turned, expecting to see Zenith. It was the Unicorn Scribe. She was dragging herself across the broken asphalt, a swath of red smearing out from a tattered flank. <clears throat> An explosion had torn off one of her legs. I, she said weakly, focusing on me as if her life depended on it. Don't understand. Her life didn't depend on me. It was ready over. For the second time that day, I administered painkiller, all that I had left, to a pony who should have been my enemy. I found myself laying down on a straw bed roll in the common lot of Arbu, watching colorful ponies trot about. Many of them stopped to wave hello or trot up to greet me. Friendliest town in the wasteland had been the claim on their sign, and they seemed determined to live up to that. As one pony, a fairly ugly puce-colored mare, with a withered left hind leg and a cutie mark that looked like a stew pot, told me, Well, we got to be good at something, and everything else about this town sucks, so it might as well be us. That's the good part, right? Most of the storefronts had boarded over windows, except for the helping hoof Quick Care, whose windows were covered in aged filters, or flyers, and posters, and Virtue Comics, which no longer had a front wall, much less windows. Still, the entire place was clearly in use, and home for half a dozen pony families. We would be spending the night there. The good ponies of Arbu insisted on being gracious hosts after we came to their merchant's rescue earlier. I was too numb to argue, or, really, to feel anything. Part of that, I knew, was the painkillers that Velvet Remedy had doped me up with before wrapping me in enough bandages to be a museum exhibit. Come see the mummy of the rare stable dweller. Beware the curse. I couldn't remember how the fight ended. I couldn't remember much past holding the unicorn scribe as she passed from this life. I had a concussion, and Velvet Remedy warned that I might have blacked out. Thanks again for your help, stranger, the merchant pony was saying to Calamity. That might have been the end of me if you hadn't stepped in. Velvetomini trotted up to me, seemingly out of nowhere. She gave me a gentle kiss on the horn, as if I was her filly. How's your head? I grunted in response. You'll be okay, little Pip, she said smoothly. Just rest. She sighed as soon as she said it. Why do I even bother saying that? Where were you just now? I asked, changing the subject. Helping patch up the merchant's brahmin, she replied, indicating the two-headed kettle. One of them took a few bullets, and the other had a sil sliver of glass wedged in her hoof. There'll be another day before the two of the first brahmin can travel. So the merchant will be joining us for dinner. I nodded. That was nice of you. I wondered how the hell you could notice a sliver of glass in the bottom of a creature's hoof. I mean, they were standing on it, right? Oh, she told me, Velvet said casually as I vocalized the last question. Then she kissed my head again, informing me, I'm going to sit with Calamity. She trotted off, leaving me wondering when she had picked up the ability to communicate with animals. The gears of my mind finally broken, 
and I was sure I was missing something. Getting up, I started looking around. I had nothing better to do, and my usefulness seemed to be limited to shooting things. I played another audio log of the unnamed mall security guard. Spent all day at my niece's birthday party. First time I actually wanted to be called away. So, naturally, no pony had any problems. I was tempted to feign a call away. I know that's awful and selfish of me. But Darling is suffering from wartime stress disorder. And there's really nothing I can do to help. I hated just standing there feeling useless, sharing worried looks with my sister as Darling went on and on, muttering things like, So what if it's my birthday? We could all be dead tomorrow. I hate this war. Why does it have to be like this? Is it really too late to come to a peaceful resolution? I'm not sure all zeros are bad. No pony was enjoying the party. According to Sis, Darling had been depressed for months now, and nothing she does seemed to pull her out of it. She was really hoping the birthday party would raise the girl's spirits, but if anything, it soon have made her even more withdrawn. Sis is at her wit's end. I advised her that it was time to call on the Ministry of Peace. Darling needs help that we can't give her. One of the RB ponies trotted up to me, a canteen around her neck. Would you care for some water? I realized I was parched and nodded. My pipa clicked softly as I levitated the offered canteen close. The mare looked apologetic. I'm afraid all we have is dirty water here. The purifier's down again. Been down all week. We've captured as much rainwater as we could, but we're saving that for the children. I nodded, understanding, and took a small drink, just enough to be polite and to wet my mouth, but I remembered that it might be a long time before I had water in this good thing, even this good again. I took a deeper sip. The goddesses only knew what the water would be like in Canterlot. Velvet Remedy was loading up her canteens with pure water before we left Tempony. Get! Get your sorry hides out of here! Y'all ain't wanted here! I jumped at the voice booming from the loft above, what had once been a custard cake shop. Grandpa Rattle, you get back in your room! The mayor with a canteen shouted back. Get out! Get out and don't you ever come back! The crotchety old buck yelled, levitating a stick and wiggling it in a threatening manner. I've got a shotgun! He had a stick. The mayor looked abashed. Please don't mind Grandpa Rattle. His mind's a bit gone. Above, I saw the green mare with the orange mane, whom I'd spoken to before, appear at the buck's window, and gently, but forcibly, guided him back into his room. The canteen mare gave me an embarrassed smile as she reclaimed her canteen, and trotted off. I shook my head, feeling a bit woozy, and looked around for my friends. I glanced towards where Pyrelight was sleeping, perched on an old vendoring sign, above where the Brahmin were tethered. She was glowing softly, mostly healed and slipping off her injuries. I trotted closer, admiring the subtle majesticness of the sleeping phoenix. I clicked another audio diary entry. Today has been the latest chapter in the continuing war between Mr. Bean and Jumacha Joe. And I must say, I really don't like where this is heading. Jumacha Joe has threatened to sue Mr. Beans over his latest advertising campaign, which features the assertion that all our beans are equestrian grown. According to Jomacha, the ads are trying to paint Starbucks as an unpatriotic, suggesting that some of their beans might come from zebra lands. I tried to point out that the ad said no such thing, but he wouldn't listen. I talked to Mr. Beans about the new ad, and he said, and I quote, Hey, I'm not saying his beans are zebra beans. I'm just saying, you know, do you know where his beans come from? Because I don't. But our beans are pure, 100% patriotic pony beans. That's all I'm saying, okay? Just awesome. Mr. Bean reminds me that winter was almost here, and that winter makes or breaks a pony in the coffee business. He needed every single edge he could get against Starbucks. 
I told him that maybe he should instead try to make coffee that didn't taste like it was filtered through something used to wipe a mule's backside. But that's how coffee's supposed to taste, he told me.